Wednesday, October 3rd, 1979, Windsor Locks, Connecticut. A tornado has just bulldozed through the heart of town, the home of Greater Hartford's Bradley International Airport. Stunned residents are walking in what looks like a war zone as airplane parts are scattered across State Highway 75. Little do they know, they just survived what will be the costliest tornado in American history at the time. Several hours earlier, it was gray and showering, but it was not a cool October rain. Instead, the air was muggy in southern New England this morning, an unlikely characteristic of the weather for this time of year. Responsible for this unseasonable air mass are a pair of surface lows aligned over Pennsylvania and the Delmarva Peninsula. Up above, a cool cutoff low barrels northeast, bringing strong ascent with it as atmospheric instability built across the surface warm sector ahead of the lows. Moisture was funneled inland as the warm temperatures caused large amounts of evaporation from the ocean. Along the front of the low is a line of morning thunderstorms, spinning up a couple of brief weak tornadoes in Pennsylvania. East of this cold front well into the warm sector, a storm would initiate just to the south of Long Island where ascent was maximized. Steering winds aloft would bring this maturing storm due north over Long Island and into southern Connecticut. As the primary surface low funneled strong easterly winds, the storm organized into a northward moving supercell. Ahead of the developing storm was the National Weather Surface Office at Bradley International Airport in Windsor Locks. Knowing that thunderstorms are probable with the oncoming system, meteorologists look over the latest data at their disposal. The combination of sounding data and radar scans suggested that the oncoming storm was not reaching the tropopause, suggesting it would not be able to produce significant severe weather. However, unbeknownst to them at the time, they were getting bad data. The tropopause was in fact much lower, making lapse rates significantly steeper with thunderstorm cloud tops overshooting the tropopause. The storm was nearing peak intensity and heading straight for Windsor Locks with no severe weather warnings in place. The supercell would undergo a merger with a weaker cell, colliding into the surface low's warm front. This merger, perfectly timed with a boundary interaction, was all that was needed to kickstart the Windsor Locks tornado just before 3 p.m. local time. The tornado would touch down here in Pequannock, rolling over some farm fields next to the Farmington River. However, it would eventually get into some neighborhoods and hit the Pequannock Elementary School. Fortunately though, school was not in session at the time. Across from the school, the Pequannock Community Church would have its roof completely ripped off. Numerous houses in the village of Pequannock would be completely leveled, many reduced to their foundations. On Oxcart Drive, siblings Frank and Dominique Corbett are walking home from the bus stop when the rain suddenly stops. They turn and look up and see the tornado. They'd make a break for a culvert when it would surround them. As they hit the ground, Dominique would turn her head and witness a house disintegrate into the tornado. The two would survive the tornado with minor injuries. Further north was St. Joseph's Cemetery, where headstones would be toppled and some completely pulled out of the ground. The tornado would leave Pequannock, crossing State Highway 20 into Windsor Locks. The tornado would make its claim to fame here, east of Bradley International Airport, as it worked its way parallel of Highway 75. While it was reaching peak intensity, an airliner was trying to land at Bradley International while the tornado was over the eastern half of the airport and would have to abort the landing. Just down the road from here is the New England Air Museum, which would take a direct hit, destroying two dozen priceless vintage aircraft and damaging several more as the main hangar would be completely destroyed. Just north of the Air Museum, also on the grounds of Bradley, was the Connecticut Air National Guard base. These hangars also stood no match against the tornado and would be shredded, claiming the stowed helicopters as well. The vortex would glance the airport's weather monitoring station, registering a gust of 87 miles per hour. To the east of the airport are a number of businesses, hotels, and restaurants. They too would be subjected to the full force of the tornado. After crossing the end of runway 24, the storm would traverse into Suffield, this farm town would avoid the worst of the tornado, but would still have several homes damaged and multiple tobacco barns collapsed. Crossing the state line into Massachusetts, the tornado would continue its weakening trend in the Feeding Hills section of Agawam. 
roofs and trees were the main casualties at this stage of the tornado's life. The tornado's final moments would be here in Westfield, Massachusetts. It would finish churning through the Feeding Hills section of Agawam, cross the Westfield River to my right here, and then cross into Westfield, where it would finally rope out east of Runway 2 of Barnes Air National Guard Base. The tornado had almost just hit its second airport of the day. The residents of Pequannock and Windsor Locks were left in shock immediately following the tornado. There was nothing that indicated that something remotely like this was even possible that day. Given the scope of devastation, officials initially believed that there could be hundreds of fatalities. The National Guard, whose base had just been hit, quickly mobilized to secure damaged areas to prevent any potential looting. Connecticut's governor, Ella Grasso, who lived only a block away from the tornado's path, imposed a curfew while President Jimmy Carter declared Windsor Locks a disaster area to mobilize FEMA resources. 139 people were admitted into a local hospital with substantial wounds, while hundreds more were treated for minor injuries. Somehow, despite no warning for a heavily populated area, only three fatalities occurred in the Windsor Locks tornado. Two construction workers sought shelter in their work truck when it would be penetrated with debris, while another woman was found deceased outside of her flattened Pequannock home. Hartford being the insurance capital of the world, it wasn't long before appraisers were assessing the property's damage just up the road in Windsor Locks. With dozens of totaled aircraft and airport facilities, coupled with the population density of the affected neighborhoods, the price tag associated with this tornado would quickly skyrocket. Damage estimates accumulated to a staggering $420 million making it the costliest tornado in American history up until that point. When adjusted for inflation, that would equate to nearly $1.8 billion, which makes it seventh on the list of America's costliest tornadoes today. Among the insurance appraisers pouring over the damage were Roger Rockimoto, Dwayne Stiegler, and Peter McGurk, staff members of Dr. Ted Fujita, Mr. Tornado himself. They would conduct both aerial and ground surveys of the damage and compile the evidence. When analyzing the survey imagery, Fujita and the team found a series of downburst patterns along the eastern flank of the tornado's path. This unique finding, which may have been highlighted thanks to the abundance of trees in New England, was some of the first substantially documented effects of a supercell's rear flank downdraft, and potentially the more modern discovery of a tornado's rear inflow jet. Fujita would assign the Windsor Locks Tornado an F4 rating on his scale, the second highest possible rating. Meteorologically, this tornado was a statistical anomaly. With New England far removed from traditional Tornado Alley, coupled with the unusual October timing, it goes to show that violent tornadoes can still occur with the perfect alignment of atmospheric conditions, no matter the location or timing. As of today in 2024, it is almost impossible to tell that a violent tornado impacted this part of Connecticut, never mind one of the costliest in U.S. history. Nonetheless, the mental scar runs deep for the longtime residents of Windsor Locks.